From Washington, D.C. in business today, three things to know. First, coming to America, more than 40 heads of state from across Africa descend on Washington for the biggest Africa conference in U.S. history. Then, as the summit opens, the fear of Ebola hangs over it. The latest on the virus and how it's infected the mood here. And can the U.S. catch up to China in the race to invest in Africa? A rise exchange starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Schmertz, an unprecedented three-day conference bringing in more than 40 African leaders from 51 countries here to Washington, D.C. is underway. It has been years in the making. It comes, as many would say, China and Europe have pulled ahead of the United States in business development in Africa. We are going to have complete coverage of day one of the summit. But first, the headline topic here is about a killer, Ebola. Because of the outbreak in Africa, there are concerns about security here in the United States. Dr. Ida Bergstrom practices internal medicine at Farragut Medical and Travel Care and joins us now to update us exactly about what's happening in Washington, D.C. and to talk to us a little bit about this uh, virus. Uh, Ida, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, so what have you heard as far as the precautions that are being taken here? And do we need to take precautions? I think we need to be fairly understanding that this is a very serious virus, although it's not easy to catch. So the precautions are uh, many of the pilots are being told, for example, if there are people that are overtly ill on the flight, mm -hmm. to let the people on the ground know at the airport so that those patients may be quarantined and tested negative. But what you also need to understand is that this virus has a very long incubation period. So many people who come back uh, may not even show real signs or symptoms up to three weeks after they return. And the symptoms are very nonspecific, and there can be many other causes. Uh, as far as, as we know, is the virus able to be spread when you're not symptomatic yet? As far as we know, that is not the case. Usually people need to be febrile, um, having muscle aches, and really feeling pretty badly and showing symptoms for it to be transmitted. Uh, when they talk about health screening here, what is happening? Well, uh, this is a misnomer, I think. I think a lot of what they are trying to do is look to see, is someone look acutely ill? You know, there were, back in 2009, we had the thermo uh, temperature things where, at the airports where they would try to assess whether people had fevers or not. And I just don't think that's realistic on a mass screening level. And plus, in all honesty, there's a lot more likelihood of someone being sick with something else, the like common malaria. cold, and malaria, which, which, which kills, kills far area. more people mm -hmm. in, in, in Africa. Uh, so as far as any concern of, of people coming from the area to Washington right now, there were those who said they should have canceled the whole conference. Overblown, do you think? No, I mean, I think it's something for all of us to be aware of, but I think the media has done a really good job as far as educating the public that this isn't something that you and I in this kind of an encounter would be able to transmit to one another. It's much more uh, really intimate contact with body fluids and being around people who are overtly sick. All right, and so what is the next step here, do you think? We've, um, we've brought back two patients, I believe, uh, two Americans. In your opinion, uh, is there any concern there? They're Americans. There's an argument to make that we need to go and bring Americans back, especially people who are there on a good humanitarian issue. Uh, the precautions good enough? Well, from everything I've seen, uh, Emory Hospital really seems to be top notch and totally prepared to deal with a situation like this. You know, there are a lot more highly communicable diseases that this center um, has trained for mm -hmm. over the years. And uh, I think they'll do a really great job containing not only the virus, but treating those two patients. And when you talk to patients, you're hearing from people who are worried about this? We are. Uh, most of it has been phone calls. We've had a few patients come in um, that have been requested to by their employer, for example, if they've just recently returned. Um, and most of it is just a uh, need to reassure. Okay. Dr. Eder Bergstrom from Farragut Medical and Travel Care. Thank you so much for your insight Thank today. You we'll talk to you later in the week, probably. So what does it take to get world leaders of an entire continent in one place? And what exactly are the goals of the summit? Well, we spoke with the former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs under President Bush, Jende Frazier. And here's a little bit of that interview. Well, the Africa, U.S. Africa Leaders Summit was part of the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, which was intended to both 
promote export-led growth in Africa, as well as increase U.S.-African engagement and partnership. And mandated within that legislation was a head of state summit. And now that was in 2010 or 20, 2000 when it was um, put in place, and now 14 years later we're actually getting there. So it's really significant, and the hope of those of us who work on Africa is that this summit will repeat itself, because it really does offer an opportunity not only for the presidents to speak, but for civil society, for the private sector, um, from at the ministerial level, for everyone to come together and really have a serious engagement on Africa. So it's very, very important. And you say it's finally coming together, which poses the question, really, are we playing catch up to countries like China and to certain countries in Europe. The criticism has been we have fallen far behind because we focus a lot on aid and not on development. Well, there's always been an important focus of American business in Africa. Um, certainly oil and gas is the one that people think about, but business has always been there. Um, I do think that having this large forum, uh, yes, clearly J Japan has had forums, you know, China's had a number of, of forums. And so America certainly is behind on having a forum, but I don't believe that we're behind in terms of engagement. We can do more, certainly. Different administrations have done more or less, um, but hopefully with this forum, as well as the focus that President Obama has brought to Africa since his trip last summer, we'll see that a continuation of the level of engagements that I think we had um, in the Bush administration and even in the Clinton administration. And I want to get back to that in a moment, but you were, you were very involved in ending conflict or helping to end conflict in various areas in Africa. Conflict is still a problem, isn't it? And you're not ever going to get the economic development if you continue to have, have fighting. Uh, what more can this administration do when it comes to conflict in Africa? Well, I actually think President Obama has done very well, although very it's been quiet. Um, the support for African peacekeepers has continued. Um, none of those initiatives have gone away, and those initiatives were built on from the Clinton administration, increased money during the Bush administration, and even additional engagement um, from the Obama administration. So on the peacekeeping front, we've continued to be very proactive. Um, we're also working on the counterterrorism front. Um, I think they've had a very strong support for the Somali government. Um, they're continuing to work with the Nigerian government and others across the Sahel. And so I, I think that it's really about building and strengthening the capacity of African countries as well as the region as a whole to work together to counter these threats, transnational threats in general, but certainly conflict um, in creating that collective security framework through um, African peacekeeping capacity. Uh, you're, of course, in the private sector now as well, focusing on agriculture. And agriculture is such an important issue in Africa. And is part of that a technology solution in agriculture that's maybe lagging behind? Yeah, it is. So what I'm specifically doing through a company called Africa Exchange Holdings Company is helping to build commodity exchanges, both in Nigeria, which is Africa's largest market, but also in East Africa, which is Africa's most integrated market. Um, and the technology solution that we bring is actually a NASDAQ um, electronic trading platform. Um, and NASDAQ trading platform means that you can trade on our exchange from anywhere in the world. You can trade from your floor. bedroom. Right. You can trade from your office. You can trade. We have a trading floor as well, but you don't have to have a trading floor. You can trade from the airport. You know, so it, it really is trying to integrate the market through technology. Coming up from Washington, D.C., we'll take a look at the markets back in New York and a little bit later, encouraging more U.S. corporations to invest in Africa. Rise Exchange from our nation's capital is coming right back.